Hello, everyone. This is Hossein Mokhtarzadeh, and this is about the strategy. I'm very pleased today to introduce you to Simon Klus, who is an honorary senior fellow at the Peter Doji Institute for Infection and Immunity. Um, he advises on communication and engagement there. Prior to this role, for about 15 years, he, has, he was a director of Melbourne Engagement Lab at the University of Melbourne where it has the reputation of leading an innovative university through training, encouraging, and facilitating some of the Australia's brightest minds to make their work accessible to non-academic audiences. So I've been so lucky to, to learn a lot from Simon. So Simon recently published two books that we're gonna talk more about those two books as well. So Simon, welcome. How are you? I'm not too bad, thank you. Awesome, congratulations on your two books. Yes, it's sort of quite exciting. And in fact, uh, there's, um, there's, it's becoming a bit of a snowball because there's three more suddenly in the pipeline out of them. Oh, Literally really? Ago, wow. There were two books, and now there are three more rocketing ahead. <laughs> so pro probably we should I think just... it's I think it's what isolation does to you. <laughs> that's that's what I, want, I, was, I was going yeah. to tell you. So maybe every week we need to get <laughs> mm. <laughs> to talk to you about one more. One of the few good things about lockdown. This is, I mean, you really take advantage of the lockdown. Yes, you spend three months thinking, "What the hell am I going to do?" And then, you know, and then you go, oh, "All right, I'll write a book." You know, <laughs> a book. <laughs> T tell us about them. So, one of them is about about researchers. Well, there's, there's, they're both on the same theme, and, and essentially, what I do, you know, it's you know, it's the same. What I do could be put in the back of a postage stamp. It's basically, "You're smart. Tell us about it," and that's literally it. And you know, it's how you do it that the books are all about. So, the one book, which conveniently is just a hand. Oh! <laughs> It's not, it's not still out there. In fact, right? that's that's something I learned from a student who he, uh, Martin Plowman had a really good book from his PhD thesis. It was about, it wasn't about UFOs. It was about the people that believe in UFOs. And he got lots of interesting media because it was about UFOs and people thought, you know, oh, great, this is going to be great stuff. And he learned this little trick that whenever you have a TV interview, they put you on standby, you're on hold. And what you do is you just casually sit there looking at your own book. And so when the camera, camera comes on you, it's like, Oh, I'm sorry. Was I looking at my book? You know, <laughs> so I learned that from a student. Um, what I did essentially for 15 years and then put into the book was to encourage, motivate, coerce, prod with a stick, anything that it took to get people like yourself, PhDs, early researchers, some quite senior st senior staff occasionally who knew incredible, amazing things, but couldn't get that story across to the, the general public simply because of what's probably a language barrier. Um, you know, we're not talking French, English or Latin, German, whatever. we're talking about academic talk, which is jargon laden, which is full of long words, complicated words. Um, you know, you know, those massive sentences, which is polysyllabic, multiclausal, all that stuff versus the general public who like short, sharp grabs. And so in an, in a way it was, it was teaching people to translate. Um, the ideas were the same. There was, they were never, ever dumbed down before anyone says that, because that is the whole point. There were still complex, complicated ideas, but they were presented in ways that pretty much anyone could understand. One of my favorite exercises I used to do was I would get, and I don't remember if you did this, but I would get PhDs to explain their thesis to a hypothetical six-year-old. Oh, yeah, I think so. I think and it was brilliant. And one of the absolute highlights of that 15 years was once I had a workshop the next day and I was planning to do this little exercise. It's a really good introduction. And I got an email about midnight from a woman in the workshop saying, oh, I've had a disaster. My babysitter's cancelled. Can I bring my six-year-old along? Yes. You know? And literally, I had PhDs explain their research to a six-year-old who was initially terrified. There was this, you know, what? She had no idea, but by the end, she was great. She was confident. She was, yeah, that was really good. No, that was really boring, you know. And and that that exercise of encapsulating what you do without losing any of the content, but making it understandable to someone who has a different look, you know, different vocabulary, different different ideas. Um, you know, the six-year-old is a great example because do they know what research is? Do they know what a university is? Do they know what you know, whatever your specialization is? So you have to learn to explain without condescending, patronizing, dumbing down, keeping the, you know, the richness. And the key, of course, is, um, is the passion. 
I mean, because the beautiful thing about research is, is that they don't, you know, you don't do a PhD for the money, you know, you don't, en- you, you don't enter a career as an early re- researcher in science or something because you're going to get rich, because you're not, you know, you do it because you care, you do it because there's absolute passion there. And so if you can cap, you know, somehow capture that passion and pass it on, that's, that's a magical thing. And that's essentially what I spent 15 years doing. It could be an article, a book, a website, a blog, a podcast, a, a, a exhibition, a document, anything. It didn't matter. But that then flowed seamlessly into book two, which was quite specifically the three minute thesis competition. So it's a little, and, and I used to have a bit of a, you know, a, a sort of a rough PDF out there that people would borrow occasionally. And I essentially polished it, made it into a, a nice little book, because I think the three minute thesis competition for any PhD student is probably the best thing you can do. I mean, obviously, you've got to do a PhD and a, write a thesis, but other than that, in terms of learning how to present what it is that you do, who you are, what you know, the three minute thesis competition is absolutely gold. And anyone who's done any, you know, done any good in that competition has gone on to great things, um, as you well know. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I said in the beginning that I, I love to speak to you always, as you know, uh, even when, when I was in the States, come back and we always had coffee together. So I always like enjoyed uh, sitting down learning and you were one of the early people who really encouraged, encouraged me in many aspects of my public speaking and things like that so I used to be like a radio host back before before I actually started my PhD but when I went through all these um, two minute decisions you know and I couldn't even believe that I can do it but <laughs> eventually when, when I worked with you guys I realized oh there's something that you can actually use it and basically uh, use that passion that you absolutely have. and and you are in the book because there's a oh, really? i remember yes i <laughs> not uh, it's the first time i'm hearing that. in an interesting in an interesting way because one of the things are i mean i remember um lots of bits and pieces from everyone but i remember you went to queensland you went to the what yeah, was then right called there, yeah. it was then was the trans tasman it's become pan pacific um, asia pacific now exactly. trans tasman you got up there you did your thing and controversy erupted and the judges had to go and spend hours behind locked doors because all you did was a little gesture with your foot and sort of mimed kicking a football because you were into knees injuries biomechanics and at that time the world cup was on and it was a brilliant it it was a bridge i mean what one of the things i encourage people to do is to find the bridge between what you know and what the audience knows and in your case you know you knew injuries, knees, legs, muscles, but whatever. And they were hearing the World Cup all day long. It was on the radio, on the TV. They couldn't escape it. And it was, a, you know, it was a gift for you. It was a gift. And so you did this little mime of kicking football. Well, the judges, was it performance? You know, was it allowed within the rules? Was it? And of course it was. But, they, you know, being academics, they like to talk about it for quite a long time. So, yes, you're in the book. You and your fo- your kicking. I didn't know that. It is, this is amazing, and I feel really uh, grateful that you be part of a small part of the book. But um, look, lots of people write in academia. But what what you're saying is not just academia. It could be in any scenario. You see someone and you want to impress them, or you use a new application, or you are seeing someone. You know, there's a uh, common things about the CEO. Or how you see a CEO, how how you want to impress them, or pitch your idea, and all these things can be. Well, it's, yes, it's, it's, I'm not even impressed on, um, it, the, the, the example, the classic example is when you go home to family Christmas and, you know, everyone, oh, you know, he's back, it's, it's at university, yes, you know, and eventually someone will pluck up the courage and go, so, so what are you studying again? And you have to, and often it's, you know, it's, I, would, I call him Cousin Barry, you know, he's in the corner, he's had probably one more drink than he's normally used to, he's not totally drunk, but he's very friendly, and he wants to hear about your PhD, and and your the challenge is to, for you to tell cousin Barry or, or you know whoever great grandma or whatever in three minutes is a nice time, but that's probably a bit of a luxury. You've probably only got thirty to sixty seconds uh, to tell someone who's got a different life experience, different vocabulary, different interest, different everything. You know that you have in a way you have nothing in common, but you do because you know 
that whole human experience. So you get the passion, you encapsulate it, you get it across in 30 seconds. It's a really good example. Um, and that's how lots of people start. Lots of people, when they come to workshops, we often have a, you know, why are you here, a session. And a lot of people will say, I try and tell people about my research and, and they sort of their eyes glaze over. And it's not necessarily even outside academia. Sometimes it's in their department, but it's from a different section. So everyone likes to think that, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a medical specialist, therefore it's hard to talk to historians or artists or accountants or whatever. In fact, sometimes I'm a specialist in this joint of this finger and I'm finding it really hard to talk to people who do thumbs, you know, because everything is so siloed and so specialist that, that sometimes the finger people can't talk to the thumb people. In fact, they can, they just have to work out how to do it. You know, you're right. That, that's something that I realized over the years that we all, what we do, like uh, maybe in academia or the industry, we are asking questions and we're trying to address it today in a creative way, basically. And the methodology would be different, you know, things would be different around that, how we, we formulate it. And it's actually, you mentioned this on that document about the book, and you reminded me of, of a couple of friends, that you, you know them. Uh, it was interesting that we, after our, our like, interview with them, two minutes, you know, and all this, and two months, and we, the, the ne next for the year after, we, there was another uh, program, you know, like a couple of old years, G Call, they call it, like graduate program for leadership and stuff. And it's funny. In that, we have like five PhD students, three of us won through the PhD competition. <laughs> <laughs> Just that we did that, it was, it was amazing that Sarah and I think it was another lady uh, who came in a bit later, and, you know. But what we could talk very well, could talk like maybe hours <laughs> about, and, and one of us was like engineer, and the other one is into education and uh, linguistic, and the other one into zoology, I guess, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong. So, uh, this is the amazing part of it. You can actually have a conversation. Oh, this. yeah. And it is, it's it's an absolutely essential skill these days. And it's, I mean, you know, the, 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 everyone jokes about the getting into the elevator and turning around and there's Bill Gates with a blank checkbook and you've got 30 seconds. But a lot of that happens. You know, it's no different to presenting for a grant. It's no good, different to job interview, you know. Exactly. Um, and the paper version, I always remember, often I would be brought in to look at, um, quite complex grant applications and to help people, you know, frame them and write them. And what I noticed is that over the years, the, the, the grant application forms, they were still huge, they were still complicated, but this box was emerging on the front, which was tell us about your research in, you know, 50 words or two lines or whatever. Um, what I found out was that, that more and more income, you know, you, you advertise a grant, you've got a million dollars to give away, and surprise, surprise, lots and lots of people apply for it. The easiest way to sift in that first stage is A, to Google, and B, to read the box on the front. And so people were putting an enormous amount of effort into the charts and the, and the budgets and the descriptions, which is fine, you know, and which you have to, but what they weren't getting was the fact that they're never gonna read those until you're at stage two. Stage one, the box on the front is, is, you know, in a way it's, it's a disposable throwaway thing. In a way it isn't because that is what gets them to stage two when they actually look at your application seriously. And so that being able to encapsulate in that little box or in that, you know, 10 second talk or whatever is absolutely vital. Um, it, it, you know, it's often make or break. Definitely, definitely. So if you, you, have, you have enormous experience like to communicate basically in, in this area and actually helping other people skills that they built so what what do you see in terms of like top let's say three kind of skills that you need to focus on you know of course passion we talked about it you know you are a researcher you are really passionate you want to share your ideas and sometimes because of you haven't developed these skills you can't or you know um you're kind of maybe introvert you, you don't want to really talk to people so how, how did you find over the years um that you can actually focus and actually accelerate this type of communication skills? Um, I think the, th the thing that I learned over, I mean, you know, way before um, doing the engagement lamp and all that stuff is that, I mean, way back, I was an, in, I wasn't an actor. Um, I was a, a theater creator performer. I did a, you know, quite a specific physical thing, but I essentially I stood in front of people and communicated stuff, which was sometimes was comedy, comedy, sometimes was stories, whatever. But it, but essentially, it was conveying information of a sort to an audience. And 
what I quite quickly learned, and you you know you have to learn in order to be successful, is that, and I always use the that I have a the forty nine fifty one ratio I apply to so many things. I think in this instance, as a both as a performer on stage and entertainment, and as an academic standing, doing a three minute thesis competition, doing a seminar for the department, doing what, um, defending your thesis, for example you at the very most are 49% of the equation and your audience is 51% or probably more. And so it's that notion that the audience matters more than you. So it doesn't matter that you get it. It doesn't matter that you understand it. It's not about you anymore. It's actually about someone else. And the same applies to the act of writing. Unless you're writing a diary that's under lock and key under the bed, someone is always going to read it. So whether it's an email or a best-selling book or anything in between, it's that 51% or more. It's that the audience, the reader, they matter more. And, and as soon as you get that, and you can, and, and in the process that I used to do with people, you can actually see, it's almost like a light, you know, the light bulb goes off or the switch is flipped. Ah, yeah, it's not for me, it's for them. And as soon as you focus on that, that helps you so much because you've then got to think about their understanding, their vocabulary, their experience. Um, you've got to think how, you know, how do they want to consume their information? If you're just looking in general about communication, for example, that decision is, you know, do I tweet? Do I do a website? Do I write a book? Do I stand and give lectures? Do I go to get a soapbox and rent in the street? You know, it's really the decision is actually out of your hands. The question should be, ah, oh, well, okay, my audience is, um, you know, someone who's interested in whatever. Where do they get their information? How do they like to receive it? Do, do they like to walk down the street and be shouted at? Do they prefer to log on and look at websites? Uh, do, you know, are they going to look at Twitter on their phone? How do they receive their information? Which then tells you how to communicate to them. So everything is all about the reader, the listener, the audience. Once that gets into your head, it actually becomes so much easier. Basically, what I understand is you're trying to get what the needs of the audience are. Mm, because, because you're doing it for them. You're, you're not yes. doing it for yourself. I always used to say, I'd, you know, when I'd start a lecture or a workshop or whatever, I'd say, um, if you people weren't here, I wouldn't be talking. You know, you don't stand and talk in empty rooms for the sake of it. You do it for the people in that room. Um, you don't, you know, it's a lot of effort writing a book. You don't write it for yourself. You write it for your readers. Uh, and they matter more than you. Simple as that. Yeah, this is this is amazing. If you, if you actually shift things, I think this is this is you see it in the in different industries as well. People, companies who really understand the need of their customers, mm. they are more successful than the rest. So you can't really just imagine. Oh, this might be what they need. But some people actually are really good at understanding their customers. Well, it's I mean, it's horrifying, is it? Because I I quite like to horrify academics because they're so easily scared um you know sometimes you can i talk about coke and mcdonald's um you know and i'll say that mcdonald's doesn't invent a new burger because they like the taste of the you know whatever they go out and they ask their customers what do you want you know do you want a new burger do you want this do you want that um nike doesn't invent a new shoe coke doesn't come up with a you know a new flavor unless they understand that there's an audience for it um you know, that's how it works. You're doing it. You're never doing it for yourself. You're always doing it for other people. I mean, it's, that's, I think maybe, maybe it's, it's, it's something in our educational system. Did you, did you find, I mean, it's what, what you guys have been doing in, in the last many years, years, you were within the educational system, but uh, it was sort of extra. Uh, extra. Well, it's funny. I always felt like I was, I always felt a bit like the enemy within like I was sort of within it, you know, like it, on, my, on my pay slip, it said universities, yeah. ah, therefore I was an academic. On the other hand, there was I standing outside going, no, I don't understand what you're talking. I mean, in, uh, in a way, it was quite easy what I used to do. If someone said something complicated, I would just go, no, don't understand. You know, I could just reduce it to that, say it again, don't understand. Say it again. So in, in a way, I was the outsider looking in, but from within the system. So it was an enviable position. I mean, you know, that it was it's quite brave of an institution to put, throw someone in there who doesn't necessarily follow the party line um, and is quite prepared to put boots on and be quite blunt and rude about it, as I was occasionally. Um, good. You know, it was a good no, it thing. Is, it is a good thing, exactly. So I, I still remember you guys were kind of involved in like the, at that time it was called MSGR. Yeah. 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 So I started in what was called the Melbourne School of Graduate Research, which then was 
Um, there's a BIPT is the phrase that's used at Melbourne because we used to have the business improvement program, BIP, which did anything but improve. But anyway, it's neither here nor there. Um, MSGR ceased to exist. I was just say it was in receivership. It, no, it was just got rid of, which was such a shame. Um, it was actually, when it started, it was innovative. It was leading, um, world, it was world leading and world copied. I know the woman who was the former dean of MSGR um, left to go to UBC in Vancouver and they set up their um, equivalent of MSGR as an ex exactly as a, a model from MSGR they're still going strong and and they are doing great things for their PhDs for their postdocs for their early career researchers um, for some reason Melbourne decided it was not a good thing yeah, and I, I, I still get a hint of it too. I still can't believe that because I am one of those graduates and I still remember all those wonderful you know like PhD was one thing that you are yeah, doing technical stuff and whatever you want My, my main love and my main like uh, passion was basically going to MSGR and whatever mm. they provide, what you, you guys provide that. And then that helped me a lot in terms of communications. You, you, I remember the first time I attended one of your um, writing uh, sessions and you said that from now on, every night you're going to write a blog post. And I can't believe it, I did it for like two years. It's every night, whatever it came mm. to my mind, you know. <laughs> so that, that well, I think. Yeah. I think it's important that you have a home um, and when you're undergraduate you, you're in a faculty or a department and that sort of is your home but when you get into that the you know the PhD which is the it's the loneliness of a long distance runner you know you're on your own um, you may well be based in dentistry or business or whatever but you, you're essentially you're on your own it's a very hard slog and so you need some sort of you need a community and MSGR was a really good community um, <clears throat> sadly it's gone what, yes. what can you do? Uh, yeah, I think we both are not in any position to <laughs> get just But anyway, let's. Um, well, I can do five minutes of talking now. Um, let's move on to your next books. You know, I know that you don't want to talk about, but just in this world, tell us what they would be. Well, what I'm doing is 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 getting the you know the little that's up here onto paper. Um, and it's, some of it is just, it sort of was the right time. I mean, with this book, <clears throat> conveniently, that, that, is, that was an overnight success that took 15 years in that for 15 years, people would say, oh, you should write a book. And A, I couldn't be bothered. I was lazy, whatever. And, you know, but, but B, probably more importantly, I never knew who the audience was. And I couldn't write it until I knew who I, who I was doing it for. So that, so that I understood what they might want to know. So it went off on a long tangent um, and it became a general how to write, how to communicate book. Um, but then I looked at the market and there are so many how to write books that it was, you know, no point killing another tree. Um, and I sort of had to be coaxed into the fact that there's, that there is a market. And that, but then of course I thought about it and I thought of how many PhDs, no career researchers, if you, if you add up the universities of the world, there's a few of you out there, you know, there's all those few. And so I suddenly understood there probably was a market and they did. And people still seem to like what I had to say, therefore I should get it down on paper. And that process has continued with into the three minute thesis book. And of course, as soon as you do things like this, people give you ideas, which is, you know, you probably should probably should just stop listening to people because you do the three minutes of thesis book and someone says, well, why aren't you doing the visualize your thesis? Okay, you know, so, you know, after 3MT, my sec second favorite competition is Visualize Your Thesis, which it's instead of the three minutes standing and talking, it's 60 seconds of PowerPoint loop. So in a way, it's the it's the 3MT for the shy and retiring. So you're not there, you're not in the frame, but what is there is your research. It's still short, sharp, accessible, exciting, interesting, entertaining grabs. Um, therefore, you know, the, the, and I've been teaching that for a while, so that's gone into the four and then of course having said that someone said we well, used to stage events you should do a book about putting on events in academia okay all right well you know and i think you know i've got i've got into this this um lockdown you know inspired rhythm and i can i can actually knock these things out now um and who knows what's coming next you know, maybe that secret novel from the second drawer <laughs> no who knows maybe you know you'll be millions of copies of these sorts of because well, because so. if they well if they buy millions of copies then i can spend time on the the secret novel about the serial the one about the serial killer you know 
I know, maybe after this interview. Mm. <laughs> Some people, no, I'm sure, yeah, lots of people will benefit from, from the books because it's like at least 15, 20 years of experience and many books for people and also for young people who want to write books. And it's also, I, I mean, I hate to blow my own trumpet, but I will. Um, it's actually a lot of fun to read. So one of the things I thought is this, this book, having talked about making communication light and interesting and breezy and bright, you cannot write a boring book. Even if it's factually correct and highly informative, if it's not fun to read, you know, basically you're shooting yourself in the foot. So what of my, um, there are jokes, you know, there are, there are books about, sorry, in a book about academia, there are jokes, you know, so it's bright and it's breezy. Me, there's a mention of you, oh, there's lots of mentions. I think um, I, it's, I'm a great, a great indicator is I actually wasn't going to do an index because I thought it doesn't need an index. You know, you read it, you learn it and you go and do stuff. You shouldn't really have to look up things, but but you know pressure was put on me by the publishers who know better. You've got to have an index. All right, so I wrote an index. So the process of doing the index, I the the, the list of really quite odd things that were in. My, so you know, Sir Roger Moore is in there. James Bond is in there. Um, my favourite shirt company, Desigual, is in there. Um, Snarky Puppy, who's a band like they're in the index. So so it it wasn't quite revenge, but it was even the index was a bit of fun, you know. That's, that's amazing. I think again we can keep talking, Simon. And I would like to keep it like grand here in this. So I last one or two questions before we go. Um, you know this 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 pandemic changed everything. So in terms of we didn't talk about it, but I mean the whole idea of a communication instrument and this competition used to be or any kind of uh, any kind of communication uh, used to be like face to face easily. But now we are here and you you, you really wanted to, to do this face to face. But thanks for <laughs> my offer to, to, to do it uh, through Zoom, but um, people like to even get jobs nowadays this way or, you know, do pretty much anything and there, there will be a lot of fatigue around that. So how do you make this fun? Um, I think by doing the same thing in shorter, sharper bits. Um, I mean, I could hi quite happily stand and talk for a day in person. My record was four days in a row in Hong oh, Kong. I've seen that, four, yeah. <laughs> four, da four days of talking about three minute pieces nonstop in Hong Kong. It, you know, it's brilliant. Um, these days, I think an hour, an hour and a half, you know, is good. Um, I've done things for, I did a thing for ANU in Canberra, which was all day, but you've got to keep putting breaks and, you know, breakouts and, and other bits and pieces in. Um, so I think because the screen, it is quite tiring to look at a screen and it's quite tiring to, to you know, to do this whole technology thing. The other thing, of course, is that, that there's that added pressure that, you know, you just know your earphones going to fall out. The microphone's not going to work. You know, the this will be the day that the NBN fails, you know, and something will happen. So, and of course it doesn't, but the worry that it might is that added pressure. If you're in a room standing and talking, you can cope with pretty much anything. Um, I even saw, and again, it's in the book, I saw a three-minute thesis this guy cope with the helicopter land outside the window. It's brilliant. He just kept talking. He was so confident. He just got a bit louder <laughs> while a helicopter came down. It was brilliant. You know? Whereas, you know, that's a, that's a very extreme example of how bad it can get, which isn't that bad. Whereas there is so much other added pressure with the technology and the... And um, I mean, this is quite nice. I can see you, you know, I've done presentations where the only acknowledgement that there's anyone in the audience was a little line at the bottom of the screen that said, number of participants, 27, oh, which is, good. you know, it's so hard. It's hard work yeah, it's to do that. So I just think, I think the answer is shorter and sharper. Um, I, I like to liven things up for myself, if no one else is that I've worked out how to combine PowerPoint and camera in one feed. And so, because that was always my frustration. I'm a great, I mean, you know, I'm a great user of slides. They don't necessarily have much on them, but they keep me entertained and they, they're a little bit like an aid memoir. So there might just be one word or an image, but it reminds me what I've got to say. And I, I really missed having the pictures behind me, you know, the backdrop to my show. And for a while I just got frustrated and then I started Googling and I found that it's not that hard. You just need a bit of computer grunt because it, you know, my laptop used to get very hot, but you can combine PowerPoint camera into the one presentation, make a virtual camera, send it on. And suddenly it's it's a bit like being back in the lecture theater. Um, you know, I can gesture to this side of the screen and a picture will come up. So, so that makes it more fun. Um, 
and it makes it more fun for the audience as well yeah, i think because again it's this it's that same thing again i'm not doing it for me i'm doing it for you that is that's a nice point yeah thank you very much ivan anything else that you want to ask him no i could just hold that up though oh sorry, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. i've, Congratulations I've, on I've your... done that it's terrible how shameless you can become <laughs> it's all good don't worry about it so it's basically it, now you're a little baby so you just it, it hasn't even been out there right when is it may the first May the, may, the, may the first, but it's not too early to queue if you want to, you know. <laughs> you can still buy it. So I'll put the link here as well. In the, Thank you. I share this one with the people on YouTube. And yeah, thanks again, Ivan. All the best with the upcoming um, books and all the secret <laughs> novels that you have. And I really appreciate the time that you spend with us. My pleasure.